Yeah, what you want to talk about? Okay, I just want to. I would just want to set a level. Can you count to ten? Yeah. I don't know what do you want me to say? Okay, that's good. That's fine. Come here, Ray. Do you want to tell me a little bit about growing up in in this mill village and? Well, first of all, we we uh, we was transferred from the Louise Mill to Charlotte uh, to Hoskins Mill. My dad was he's like he's uh, run a drawing machine, and they transferred him over to Hoskins. But he didn't have a machine operator over there. So after we stayed over there a while, I forget I don't know how many years was over. Maybe five or six. They transferred him back over to Louise Mill because they got in a new piece of equipment. It was a Coleman, Barber Coleman, tying machine. It tied the warps in the place of having to draw them in, the ends through them, you know. Is that what your daddy was doing when this picture was taken? No, he was running a drawing machine when it was taken. Okay. Tell me about this period of time when this picture was taken as much. Well, I'll tell you, you're going pretty tough. Like I told you a while ago, my daddy go out and work for, for a 50 cents a day, 75. What if we could pick up when the strike was on? And, uh, so he didn't go to work during the strike? He worked just odds and ends. What if we'd pick up, you know? He, uh, like I told you a while ago, he'd, bring, he'd come into the house and, and wash his face and hands. I said, I don't watch those kids eat. If there's anything left, he'd eat. If he didn't, he'd go on to bed. And I never heard him utter a word about being, you know, uh, about the hardships he was having. But my daddy was a number one man, I guarantee it. Tell me about this picture. Well, this fella come out to the house one time. I, he made me mad, if you notice on this picture here. I had on a raggedy overhaul. been patched two or three times. But he wanted to take a picture for this strike business to show what how people was having to live during this thing. And he took my britches and tore them right there on the knee. <laughs> that guy newspaper did. He ripped the thing down, make them look a little worse, I reckon. But he didn't have to go for it because I didn't even have on a shirt. My brother had on a shirt, but I didn't have one. I just had on a pair of old ragged overhauls. And you can tell by the clothes we had on, we didn't have too much to wear. Did you have shoes or did? Well, we we got uh, he made to buy uh, daddy made to buy us shoes in the winter time, but we went barefoot in the summer. In May, starting in May, we went barefoot all year long through summertime till it got fall of year. And dad man, managed somehow or another get us get some shoes. I never forget the first pair of boots he bought me after the strike was over. He had a little side pocket in with a knife in it. He told me not to not be sure not to get cut with that knife. And I took that knife out and cut my finger about half off. See that scar? Oh, very first time I had a pouch. <laughs> but uh, we, we had a pretty, we got by, we ate, uh, we had three meals a day. Skimpy meals, you know, but we didn't go hungry. Uh, finally, when we moved back over to Louise Mill, I went. Hard, went I farmed myself out to my uncle down in Union County, running on a farm down there, and uh, I I farmed for about three, four years with my uncle. And uh, my dad and some of his friends would come down every Saturday morning and go hunting and kill rabbits and squirrels, take back home and feed the kids and mama. In the winter time, when hunting season was in. Yeah. This, um, could you tell me about living at the mill village maybe prior to the strike? I mean, you know, when your dad was well, working in the mill. I can remember when we moved over to Hoskins, it was the awfulest looking house I ever seen in my life, man. The grass was grown up high as your head in the back, and it had a big ditch in the backyard, and had cans and bottles all over. It hadn't anybody lived in the house, I don't think, for a year. And they didn't have anybody to take keep up the thing. So it was in a foul shape. Had these old cattail things growing up high as a roof all around the house. And me and my daddy worked. I can remember working day in and day out cleaning that place up. Cutting the grass with a sling blade. Wasn't no such a thing as a mower. Mower, you had to just cut with whatever you get. You know, with them 
fling blade thing, cut thing, pocket knife and hatchets to cut them old tree thing down, old cattail. Well, we got it cleaned up, and about the time we got the thing cleaned up good, we transferred him back, <laughs> back over to Louis' mill. Now, as a child living in the mill village, I mean, what did that mean? I mean, what kind of uh, what kind of rules were there that had to be followed? No, the no rules. Friendliest people you ever seen. Cotton mill people, friendliest people you ever seen in your life. If one of them had a biscuit, and you want half of it, you got it. And every night. Uh, it, Every afternoon from, say, a long dusk dark till 9, 10 o'clock, you see people hanging on each other's banisters or porches sitting. All they did visit people up and down the street and go in and talk to people. And the kids had a wonderful time playing together. No problems, no nothing as, long, as far as children are concerned. We always had somebody to play with. And, uh, of course, some of the people over there, had, some of the people around where I lived over at Hoskins, they had a little money, and their kids had bikes, you know, to play with. And uh, we didn't have any bikes. We didn't have. We couldn't afford them. But the kids that had them was willing to let you have, let you ride them, play with them, you know. Did, were you aware of the rules that the mill, that the that the mill families, that the workers like your daddy had to follow in order to stay in the mill village? Don't realize. Don't realize the thing that uh, there was in as far as in rural concern. My daddy was a. Uh, uh, he was he was a master at what he was doing. I mean, he could he could uh, what you say make them machines that he run. He could make them things go, and he was a master. He knew how to fix them. He could fix them. He could run them and made good patterns for the mill for the weave room to make cloth out of. He never had any complaint from his boss men about the patterns he made, uh, and the pattern is what. Uh, uh, what you call drawing in the the uh, yarn through the little harness and drop wires and things. It's a tedious job, but he was a master at it. There was a machine that that they had to do it with. He had a helper. Her name was Mag Garrison, and uh, and he helped her draw in, run the drawing machine. But now when he had the tying machine, when he got the tying machine, when we moved back to Louis Mill, he didn't have to have no help. Now it says here that um, now it, it it talks about everything that 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 he that he wrong five dollars some of them six some nine but like I say my daddy was a master I mean what he did he wasn't the boss man then but what the job he run was was more or less um, better than a boss man job. Because he had to know what he was doing to get them things done. Because if it didn't make bad cloth, he couldn't sell them on bad cloth. Why, why, did, why did the uh, photographer, I guess he was a news reporter, why did he come to your family? I guess he's talking around up to the drugstore and found out we had the largest family on the mill village. Is that right? Yeah. At that time, yeah. And uh, he wanted to get a hold of the largest family so he could write a news report on them on the money situation and living situation. Now, actually the houses, the mill houses that we lived in was decent houses. They weren't no junk houses. I mean, they were decent houses. Well, I can remember well that we had, uh, we had uh, what they call bed bug problems in every one of them houses because they was, had wainscoting in the house and them little bugs were getting, the little chinches as they call them, getting between the cracks and you had to, you had to go over two or three times a week and kill them so you could rest at night. If you didn't, a little bugger would eat you up. <laughs> so, now your father's wearing a suit here. Uh-huh. That was the only suit the poor man had. On only one. Uh, I, he couldn't afford to send it to dry cleaner and he'd buy Energene and clean his suit with it and mother it. Did he? Did he why, did he put it on special for this picture, you think? No, he, he kept his suit pretty clean all the time. Did he wear he, it all the time? No, 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 So no. he put it on special for this picture? Yeah, mm-hmm. My poor old mama, when them twins were born, she didn't weigh over 350 pounds. When what? When those twins were born. That's, oh, you mean she weighed that, she gained that much weight to have these babies? No, she was always a big woman. 
she's Dutch Irish and she, uh, Dutch Irish and she weighed uh, 350 when them kids were born, when them twins were born. She was just a big woman and short, real short and heavy. Could you tell me a little bit about what you remember of that strike in 34? That's when this picture was taken. The only, only thing that really, uh, really sticks in my memory is when it's ho holding all those big deals over there in front of the mill and it scared me because I didn't know what was going on. See, I, I didn't really, really know. I really didn't, uh, didn't know exactly what was going on. I knew that it was having a hard time making ends meet and uh, all, but I just didn't know what was going on. I wasn't quite old enough to understand what was going now, on. Now, you had a, a lot of family that was involved in it. Yeah. Can you tell me, tell me who they were and what, what you know about their involvement? Are you talking about my the uncles and uncle? I? Yeah. yeah. Well, my grandfather, my mother's dad, he was an expert loom fixer. Best that ever walked in a cotton mill. Everybody said that he was the very best that ever walked in a cotton mill. Well, he he was a uh, he was employed, but he wasn't making no money. Ten dollars and four cents a week, twelve dollars, something like that. Of course, his son, my mother's brother, Howard John Howard Payne. He was an executive in the mill. I mean, not a big executive, and like he was a second hand in the something or something, uh, in the weave, in the spinning room. No, in the weave room. Uncle Howard worked in the weave room. But he was sort of like a second hand, like a boss man, you know. And uh, he went around at changing time when he changed from one shift to another, and then got the guys, people all set to go to work and stuff, you know, and made out the time sheets and all. And uh, he was pretty smart. And then I had my sister. My mother didn't work, didn't ever work in the mill. Now those two got real involved in this union organizing. Do, they, you, do you remember any of that? I don't remember a thing about it. They kept it quiet when it was around the house. They never spoke about it, never said anything about it, never said where they'd been, what they'd been doing, anything. Did they visit a lot? they go to people's houses up and down the street and talk and, and you know, I don't know whether it's trying to get them to vote for the union or against it, but oh, they you were, remember them visiting people. Yeah. Did they spend a lot of time at your house? No. Your uncle and your grandpa didn't spend a lot of time here. Grandpa lived with me a while after we moved back to Louise Mill. He stayed in one room of our house. And did your grandpa and did Howard Payne get fired for all the work? No. Did they go back to work at the husband That's after right. the strike? My grandpa was working in the mill during the World War II. And he was an old man, wasn't he? Uncle, uh, uh, Doc was about uh, 75, 76 years old when he died. So it looks like um, Howard Payne was the, was he was the president of the local. Yeah. I guess it was the local for that mill, that yeah. area. Yes, he was Did the you know that at the time? I didn't know at that time. I didn't. I, I never knew until I was had, had been in the army and come back home when I found out he was president of the union. And I believe his wife Aunt Dolly told me about that. You know, I don't think the children really. Well, we didn't know exactly what was going on, you know. Because, like I said, we were poor folks, but we didn't know we were poor because everybody was poor. You know what I mean? You take people working with eight and nine young and making six and seven dollars a week and had to pay seventy five cents a week for rent. You didn't have to didn't have much. What do you, you now you know a number of these people in this picture. What do you think about that? They were having a house meeting to organize the strikers. Yep. Them was the officers of the that was Uncle Howard's handyman. All these people were. He they he was in charge of these people. He was one that told them to go out and visit people and do what to, what to do, because he was a president. He looked like a president, don't he? Here's <laughs> a big wheel. Now, did he stick? Did he stay working there after 1934? What do you remember? Uncle Howard, yeah. Uncle, Uncle Howard come back to to uh, to the to uh, to Louis Mill. And worked in Louis Mill. 
But he left Chadwick Hoskins? No, Hoskins. Oh. Well, Louis Mill own, was okay. owned by Chadwick Hoskins. But Uncle Howard, when he, when we come back over to Louis Mill, he, he, uh, he was in charge of the baseball club, and he hauled them all around in a, in a truck, you know, to where they'd go to play ball. And he had pretty good. That was good, his job. Yeah, he had a pretty good job. Well, not really, but just when they had to go somewhere, he'd take them. So he'd never. But, he did. He wasn't a second hand anymore. Yes, he was a second hand in the Louis Mill. Not in the weave room. He was in the card room in Louis Mill. Now, your mother must have been aware that her brother and her daddy were so involved, you think? Well, she probably did. I don't know if she did. Sure she did. But your daddy didn't get involved? As far as I know, he never had anything to do with it, one way or the other. So this, this now this... He was not too, too busy out trying to get a bite to eat. <laughs> Now, this photograph, does that seem, you said, does that seem... I was thinking that was where, no, I don't remember that one. That was, I believe that was at the Shadwick Mill. Shadwick. Now, I wonder, Mr. Doc, how many of your brothers and sisters went to working in the mills? I worked in the mill. Ruby worked in the mill. Bob never did work in the mill. Donnie worked in the cone mill, cotton mill. That belonged to Chevin Hart. He worked at Louis. He worked at Louis too, yeah. And what about the girls? Uh, Marianne? Dot did. Dot worked in the mill. Dorothy. Dorothy, Dorothy Ruby, and me. And Amos and Andy? They never did work in the mill, did they? No, Andy worked at a baker when he got big enough to go to work. He worked at Southern Baker in Amos. Went in service. Went in the service in Germany. Was your family, was your father proud to have this photograph oh, taken? Oh, yeah, he was taken to death by that. Really? Yeah. Why? He just liked it. He just wanted to show people what was going on, I reckon. Had a necktie and a suit. So that's the only dress Ruby had. My poor mom, she had an apron to go. So you see how, how large she was there. That's when Donnie, she was pregnant with Donnie then. Donnie then. So he really came and ripped your knees? He ripped the britches? Yes, he did. Got like britches like that toy that news man did. And oh, pulled they it down. Had, you're, you're, they had holes in them. He they, yeah, he, he just made them bigger. Where, where my knee was shown. I had patches on top of patches. Now, did you ever hear that term lint head when you were growing up? Absolutely. Sure enough. You've heard that too, haven't you, right? Oh, lint heads. What it, what it, tell me about that term. Well, it's a term that people use because some people, you know, didn't work in the mill. They had some good jobs, making some good money. And these poor people in the mills down there trying to make a living, they'd come out of the cotton mill with lint all in their hair, you know? And they'd call them lint heads. Uh, That's a, it's a, what kind of term is that? Well, actually, it's just, just a... It's like for lower class of people. Yeah, somebody calling somebody a lower class of people. It's like you would call them a lower class of people. Now is that, did, did Charlotte, was Charlotte divided like up with, you know, in the Mill Hill was here and other people who worked in other jobs lived over here. Was it real divided socially, class-wise? Yeah. The Mill people stuck together. All the people lived on Mill Hill. Like I said a while ago, you, they, you could see them hanging on people's banisters, sitting on the doorstep. Lent back against a tree. My daddy cut hair for free of charge for, I know, for 20 years. People come to the house and get him cut hair, cut their hair, and didn't charge nothing. And uh, people would come to your house at night and they'd sit out on the banister, on the steps, hang on the porch, smoke cigarettes, smoke pipe, and chew tobacco and talk to each other until 9, 30, 10 o'clock. That's all they had to do. 
wasn't no television, wasn't no first radio I ever listened to. Mr. Moore owned it, and we'd go down and listen to the news at night at 6 o'clock, 6 or 7 o'clock, me and Daddy. We'd go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday school, and hardly ever stayed for church, but we'd go to Sunday school. Take Daddy, take me, take me and my brother to Sunday school. We'd eat dinner, and then we'd go out in the woods and scout all evening until dark. Scout? Yeah. Scout, yeah, <laughs> going around looking for squirrel oh, nests, yeah, birds, and shooting its flying oh. shots. Squirrels. Now, was the first time you? When was the first time you heard the idea of a union? Was it this time? I never heard of a union until this happened. I never knew what a union was. Matter of fact, when this was going on, I don't know what a union was for. Whether it was against, for you or against you. Now, did they have national guards out by the mills with guns and all that? No, never saw a soldier. So then who, who was there, just the strikers? Just the strikers. People carrying signs and picket lines, one thing or the other. It was orderly, no problem, but it only lasts, what, three or four weeks? Yeah. Did you see your uncle out there? No, I never saw Uncle Howard, no, not one time while I was out there, or Grandpa either. I think they were behind the door people. Now what do you? Then what can you tell me about Mr. Green? About Mr. Green? Yeah. That man's as sharp as a tack. He's 86 years old. He worked in the mill all of his life. It's the only job he ever had, cotton mill. He raised uh, six young'uns, five or six young'uns, in a cotton mill. And right now he's 86 years old and as sharp as a tack. I mean, he's his mind. Is, he can tell you things that happened 65, 70 years ago. After the mail closed, he went to work. City, it was a city. Yeah, but he had all of his young ones. Charlotte. But all of his young ones were right. Mr. Green. Mm -hmm. He retired. I would city, love so. to meet him today. Is that a possibility? What do you think? I don't know what complex he lives in up there. You can call Barbara, she can tell you. It, may, it might be a possibility. If he's at home, you can see him. Now, did you all go to a mill school? Did you go to a school here? Yeah. Was it run by the mill? No, it was ho ho city school, Hoskins. Do most of the kids that went there have parents that worked in the mill? Practically all of them. There were a few of them that had parents that worked elsewhere, but they were, they were rich people. They wore white shirts at school, you know, and breeches, pants. We wore halls and patches. I was like, it I'm actually thinking. wasn't a segregated school. No, it wasn't segregated. It no, wasn't as black the people. Rich and the poor. It wasn't like that. But, you know, it, it so happened that the. Uh, and the mill. Now, what happened at uh, Christmas time? Did the mill do anything for you at Christmas time? Give out fruit or candy? or Some of the mills, you know, were very uh, paternalistic and they mm -hmm. provided the community with a social hall and clubs. My and uncle brought. Uncle Howard Payne brought us Christmas presents every year for I don't know how long. He bring every one of his kids a little something, a cap pistol or uh, some reading material, books or something for Ruby and them. And uh, sometimes he bring a little aviator type cap for the boys and just candy and nuts and stuff. Every day cost him an eight dollar now. They had saved some money. They had got a hold of some money somewhere or another. Had, they had a lot of money. The Paynes did? Yeah, Uncle Howard. And, uh, now, was he married back in 1934? Oh, yeah. He married Dolly. He, her and Dolly, him and Dolly were married four to And he has a daughter? Uh, yeah, State Manetta. Where does she live? Mint Hill. Manetta? Uh-huh. And has a son, too. She lived out there, honey, close to where he lived. Yeah. In that trailer. Oh, that's Mint Hill, Lord. Is, is she still alive? I'm sorry. And he had a son too? Yeah, John Howard Jr. He had a, they, him and Dolly had a son, uh, John Howard Jr. Yeah. And uh, Manetta was, was Dolly's was girl. So Manetta's is an old, she's older, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so 
How old is she? Is she older than you are? No. She's probably a couple of years younger than I am. Huh. Now you said you have a picture of your uncle, John Howard Payne? No, I've got a picture of my grandpa. He's in, you know, in the casket. In the casket. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's try now. I am Frank Miller Sr. Okay. I'm 79 years old, born October the 28th, 1912. I am now living at 39 Carolina Avenue, Concord, in the city. Okay. Now. Boy, I could hear that clock, boy, <laughs> a mile away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You kidding? Now. What question do you want to ask? Well, why don't you tell me about working at Brown Mill in 19... Can you tell me about working at Brown Mill at the time that they started organizing the union? Well, it was somewhere, according to the book that I gave you, that I'm out there, it was around 1934, 1933, 1934, when we started to try and organize so you didn't even get to burn on me. And I would go out with the union, the organizer, working for the union. Do you remember his name? No, I can't remember his name. I thought maybe it might have been on that book, but it wasn't. So it's and not F.L. Green. I mean, it's not Mr. Green. I wouldn't know. C.P. Would. Green. He was the president. I wouldn't know. Be honest with you. Okay. I just wouldn't know. We would sign some of them up in the middle, you know, but we had to be kind of secret about doing what we did. done. But because they would go out, you might think he was your friend, you see. But if you didn't watch out, they'd go out and get a little super that you're trying to organize or signing up people in the middle. And we kind of had to do it uh, secretly, like, you know, which then I signed up some of my overseers people for the union. But when we would have a meeting, very few of them would attend the meeting because they would have somebody, if we'd meet like up at the hotel, Concord, there'd be somebody from the real company standing on the other side of the street watching who all went in and who didn't go in. <laughs> and so it, it was a, a, a hard go. And then back then, it was hard to get a job. And that was just about all the jobs there were around here, they didn't textile. And uh, so it was hard to get a job. And that's one reason people were afraid of the union because if they lost their job, they were out. They'd have to, most of them might have to leave town and go somewhere else try to find a job. So we tried to organize, and uh, some of them went out to the big office on me, and me and my overseer were good friends. And so he told me one day, he said, Frank, you better be careful of talking about you out at the big office. Well, I knew that it wouldn't be long I'd be gone if I didn't try to keep under a little more. So I told him, I said, well, if this is the way the people want it to work like this and kill herself for nothing, I promise you one thing, I'll quit trying to sign people up. So I did. But yet I was still a union man, see. I was still believing in it and uh, believed in what we were trying to do. But I was married and had children, and I couldn't hardly afford to lose my job and leave Concord. And my overseer, he just told me that, you know, because we were really good friends. And uh, so I quit really signing up, you know, unless I really know the person. 
I wouldn't. I, I didn't bother openly like I'd been being openly with it. Yeah, I'd been to Charlotte with the man I don't remember his name who was the organizer, and uh, went out with him to Charlotte and have lunch, and, and so. It was hard back then to try to get people, uh, you know, to uh, join a union. And then they finally, they got enough that we went out on strike. And they had home guards. They'd call out the home guards and place them around the mill so if anybody wanted to go in, they could go in. And groups of people would get at the mill gates and they'd pray and holler at them if they went in, you know, them that went in. But you, uh, they'd get enough to go in to keep the mill mostly running. Why did they have that strike, do you know? Because of the condition of our work and no more money than we make. Now, uh, it was when you went in the mill back then, and they hard you, if I'm not mistaken now, I, I don't remember when we got to eight hours. It was in 1933. 33? Well, before then, when I went to work in the mill, we worked 10 hours a day and a half a day on Saturday. And I went to work, I started off working it for $13.20 an hour. I was 16 years week. old. I mean a week. And I was 16 years old. And I worked from the sweeping boy up to uh, a loom fixer. And that was about as high as you could get unless you got to be uh, second hand or overseer. And that's why me and the overseer got to be good friends, you see. Fact is, we were in together with an old pet we had. And me and him were good friends. I become an organizer for the union. Why don't you start that, that sentence again and then continue with that story? That's right. He, uh, uh, Did Red start? Or? Yeah, he started out with the union. You see, when we went out and everything, he got in with the union people, and therefore he just went on to work with, for them, see, now, as an organizer. Now, could you, now, Red was working at the mill in 1933 just like you were? Yes. As far as I can remember now, he was there at the mill just like I was. Okay. And did you sign him up? How did he was no, he no, uh, early meetings? Did he? Uh, no, that's what I'm trying to think yeah. right here about that. Because it seemed to me like that we had tried once before to organize, or they had there at the mill. Was that in 1921? Somewhere back in there. That they had tried to organize. Same somewhere, I don't know. I, I've been trying to get that in my mind, but I can't get it. Well, I know that there was once a strike in Concord and Kannapolis in 1921. It was. I believe so. That's what people have been saying. When there was a union store, that's in Kannapolis. Would that have anything to do with Concord? Well, most of the time when things happened in Concord, it happened in Kannapolis. It would start mostly in Concord and going up to Kannapolis. So you remember something about it? Yeah, it seemed Canapolis. like a, a, a earlier one uh, than this one here. Yeah. Because it seemed to me like that Red was already, now I may be wrong on this, that he was already uh, working with the union, but he had nothing to do with us trying to organize the Brown Mill. They had him sent somewhere else. I think that's the way it was, because I went with him before up to Greensboro and places like that. Now, I'll tell you what, this fella Graham, I believe, I believe it was Graham, running for governor of North Carolina against that fella that got to be governor in, from Shelby. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but anyway, the man that run for governor, he was for the Union. And I went with Haywood Lift, that was his name, they called him Red. I went with him up to uh, 
I believe it was Greenburr, where they had a, a rally up there. And that man came and spoke, you know. But he got defeated as governor. And in fact, that I think he lost his job. He had a good job and everything lost all of that, too, because of running for governor of North Carolina. No. No, now, this early union attempt in Concord, was your daddy involved in that? Good, Mom. He, he was all, my dad believed in the union, but he never would go where they had guns. If they had soldiers around the mill, he wouldn't go in. He said he had never worked under a gun before in his life, and he figured that was for men on chain gang. And he wasn't going in and work, and men standing out with a gun, because it seemed too much like working on the chain gang. So he'd, they'd always take him back, though, when the thing was over. Now, okay, so he was a member of the union, or he wasn't? I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure my dad belonged to the union, was a member of it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was, because he believed in it. But I don't remember whether he would have, see, there were not too many of us they would carry that book openly and let people see it. And uh, that's why that book been in yonder in a box for 50-some 50, 50 years. <laughs> that was my union book, and it tells you in there what local I belong to. I believe it was 109 or something like that in the front there. It said local, uh, I believe it said local 109, didn't it? Where my name, where my name's in the front down there. 1902, local, local 1902. 1902. That was the local that we had that I belonged to, you see. Now, was that a local that included people from many different mills in Concord or just the Brown? Oh, yeah, that included, Number six. well, uh, the Cannon Mills and Brown Mill were the only mills here except uh, what they call the, the uh, Oh, uh, Kerr Bleachery. Lock Mill. Yeah, the old Lock Mill up here. Now, but so that would include anybody in the mill that wanted to join the union. So, so it could be any mill. It wasn't just That's right. That's right. So do you remember where you got your membership from? Do you remember, did people come from all over? No, could no, you no. Them? It was just uh, one man come in here as an organizer, okay. you see. And he was working and trying to get people like me to sign them up and other people, you know, to sign up people, talk to them about it. And so we had cards, you know, and uh, if they would uh, join the union, we'd have them to sign that card. And then we'd take it to the organizer and he'd put them down, you see. And so all of them didn't get a book like I had uh, uh, have right there. Not right then. What did you have to do to get one of these books? Well, I just... <laughs> signed up with them, you know, and I went around with the organizer some, and uh, I got that book. And it says here your initiation fee was a dollar. <laughs> I guess that's and all then, it was. I guess then it's March, April, May, June, and here's, they stamped it every time. Yeah. And you even had a, a stamp, Textile Workers Local Union 1930, 1902. Yeah, see, back then it wasn't costing us nothing. You know, because we wasn't organized, but they were putting it down. As far as I remember, I don't believe I paid anything. It might have been a dollar every time, it's every month, something like that. I think maybe you just paid a dollar once to get in. Yeah. Now, did you have did you have formal meetings somewhere? No, but we would uh, have a meeting. I remember one that we had up at Hotel Concord, and that's what I'm talking about. There's somebody from the mill company out there watching. <laughs> to see, they'd have some from the mill company to see who all was going in, the new them, you see. <laughs> and so there wasn't very many attend those meetings because they didn't want to be seen going in. They believed in the union, but they believed in, you know, trying to get more money and less work. But they were afraid of their jobs, see. Like I said before, it was so hard to find a job. If you got out of a job, you 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 couldn't hardly find a job. Now, I was under the but you know now at that time, 
it was President Roosevelt had said that. No, no, call. Uh, you see, hon, here in this county, in this town, it was dominated by the Democratic Party, and what Mr. Charlie Cannon said, that's what went. See, uh, I'm trying to think of that uh, program that used to have the Peyton Place. You know, that used to be about a cotton mill hill, I think it was. It's something like that. One family or several dominated the whole, whole town and so forth. And uh, the Democratic Party, they dominated this town. We didn't have much back along then, didn't have much, uh, no Republicans at all, hardly to mount for anything. Okay, and that's, that's, that's what I'm telling you, yeah. but later on, in, if this was in the 50s, though, okay. when they got started, really, with the Republican Party up at the church where I passed. Now, but how did the, the fact, well, this domination from one family, that really, I guess, frightened people into not... Own all the, these big cannon mills and most all the mill houses, but Johnson owned the Brown Mill. They were in Charlotte. But yet cannon dominated the whole place around here. Yet you were still able to have a local... Oh, yeah, yeah, but most of it was secretly, in a way. It wasn't too much uh, too much to it because you couldn't get the people to come out. Now, what did you do at your meetings? Who came to talk? What did you talk about? Do you remember? No, I'll tell you the truth. I don't remember except trying to get, it to get more people signed up and, and telling us, you know, what would happen if we could ever get a union. Now, did you ever approach the, the mill to, and to, to try and get the union recognized in Brown Mill? Approach who? The Brown Mill Company. Oh, no, no. If you'd have approached the ones that uh, owed the Brown Mill, you wouldn't have been there. You'd have been gone next week. Oh, you you didn't talk union and things like that around the mill if they could keep you from it. And if you uh, they found out you was trying to organize the mill, something would happen that you wouldn't be there too long. They had ways, you know, to eliminate your job or you wasn't doing your job just right or something. They could fire you for anything, you know what I mean. They could just come up and fire you. So then who were the people, but there were a number of people that went out and did it anyway. Oh, that's right. Just and like I, just like I done, taking a chance on getting, losing my job. And I had a family, see. that That's what aggravated me. I had a family and some of them that you would talk with they, they, you couldn't get them to do anything, and they didn't have no family. And I had a lot to lose where they didn't have anything, except maybe their job, but they were able to, you know, get them, maybe a man and his wife. And you think those should have been the people that led the fight? That's right. Yeah. See, take a man with three or four or five youngins, if he got out of a job, and, uh, they didn't have all this layoff money and all you got now, where if they lay you off, you can draw money, you see. They didn't have anything like that. The welfare, the only thing they had, and there's always out. If anybody goes to the welfare, most of them, they wouldn't have anything. Now, was the, were the meetings on the Mill Hill, or were the meetings someplace that weren't on Mill property? Oh, they didn't have no meetings on the Mill property. Uh-uh. No. Now, we had one old man, he did, now at an old man chin. He uh, uh, was the gatekeeper at the mill. Now, he was a strong union believer. And I mean, the president of the Brown Mill would talk to him. And I remember him telling me one time that Mr. Moore asked him, said, Mr. Shin, why do you want to try to get a union in here? And in the mill, he said, well, Mr. Moore, y'all got a union. Doctors has got a union. The merchants has got a union, like the Merchant Association. 
and the doctors you see and things like that. And he said, why shouldn't we cotton mill people have us a union like you other professional people got? But now he did now, the old man Chin, but he, he was a strong worker for the union. And he wasn't afraid. So him and the old man Moore, who was the president of the Brown Mill Company, they were friends, you know. And who else from, with, with their... I can't remember right now whether they were or not. Now, I just can't go back. See, that's 57 years ago and I can't go back. But it wasn't just a local for one mill. It was no, it was for, for, for anybody, yeah. Trying to organize all these mills, see. Now, you see, this is the way it went back back in those days. If they found out you were a Republican and you were working in the mill, if you didn't watch out, you didn't last long. And I've been told, but of course I never had one to come up and, and ask me, but I've been told that in the cannon mill, they would tell you who to vote for. If they had a man running, they'd let you know who to vote for. And if they found out you didn't vote for him, you didn't have a job long. I do know this one man that used to work at Cabarrus Mill, and he was a strong Republican. And they let him go because of his affiliation with the Republican Party. See, they, they, the Democratic Party here in Cabarrus County was dominated by the cannon, by the Charlie Cannon, and he done a lot, I guess, for this uh, uh, little old town. But he dominated. He ruled it. See, whatever he said was law. Well, in the Democratic Party, they had their men that worked for Cannon, you see. And uh, if he told them that he wanted so-and-so in, or they would consult him about who is putting in the different offices. Now, how does that relate to what, how he uh, responded to the 19, to the 1934 strike, bringing in the troops? Well, when they went out on strike, all they done, he just got the troops to come out. Let anybody want to come in the mill and go to work, they could work, say. Them troops stood there now. I remember my dad-in-law lived on Robin Street, and it wasn't nothing but a sidewalk, and here was the mill pen. And you, Which the road, that? that the old Cabarrus mill, that one the cannon mill. Number and, five? Yeah, and you'd go in, the road was behind the house. You could sit on the front porch and look in the door down there and see the looms running, clickety-clackety-clackety, clackety, you know. And, and I'd go, to, go down to my daddy-in-law's. No, my daddy-in-law was Marsh Kinley. Okay. But I'd go to go home or go down to his house. Uh, soldiers step out and stop me. See, just a sidewalk, it went down. Won't know where I'd going. And it'd make me so mad I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but he had a gun, and I did. I'd tell him I'd go in home. And then when I thought to leave out, there'd be a soldier there. Stop you, want to know where you're going, see. And I told them several times, none of their business where I'd go. But when I went home, I had to tell them I'd go in down to my father-in-law or going home. So see, they had they had you bottled up. And if a fella wanted to work, he going in the mill. And a lot of farmers come in here, and they were working in the mill, and they owned their farms and lived on the farms. And uh, the thing about them, you see, if they got laid off, they still had their farm to go to. Yeah, I've been out there with them. Could you talk about They didn't have no picket line, you know, carrying signs like they do now. Just a bunch of people gathered together up there, you see. And this is at the Brown Mill? Yeah. Did you visit other mills at the same time to go see how they were doing? I don't remember whether I did or not, but my wife's, first wife's uncle, now, he led a group 
down at the old Gibson mill. And uh, what was his name? Ed Kinley. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he he uh, got involved with him, you know, down there. And so <laughs> when the strike was on, uh, he got in there and and led a group of the people, you know, picketing and hollering and going on at them going in. But they would go on in anyway. And there wasn't no way in the world, Harley, you could defeat the mill company. You didn't have a, have a Chinaman change heart. Because, see, they had their home guard standing out there, and anybody wanting to work, they could just go on in and go to work. And, uh, now, what happened to your union during this period of time? What was going on with your local? Well, we didn't have much. There wasn't nobody much attend the meeting because they're afraid to, you see. <laughs> they, they, they done what they could, but uh, they couldn't do much. Did you, did you all try to keep on having meetings, or do, do you remember? After the strike was over with, that was, that was it. Around here, it was over. <laughs> it's just like you've been defeated in a war. Yeah, it didn't last too long. Strike didn't. Now, what about you? Tell me about Red Lisk, because he was someone who wasn't defeated. As a, I mean, he kept on going. Oh yeah, well, he got a job with the union. Red, Red got a job and would begin to make good money. You see. And, uh, what was Red doing during this strike? I mean, what was his relationship to all of this? I don't stuff? remember. Now, Red came in, I think, and made several speeches, you know, during this strike. And they nicknamed him Six Eye Red. Instead of Eight Eye, he was wanting, wanting Rudabelt to cut it down to Six Eye today. He said Six Eye was enough for people in the cotton mill, <laughs> the way they worked, you know. And. Uh, if I'm not mistaken now, I, I, I'm not I'm not too sure about this, but you see, Red, he come in and tried to work some, I think, but uh, he was assigned, really assigned somewhere else. Now, now, a lot of folks in a lot of places, when they said, okay, go back to work, try and get your job back, their job wasn't there anymore. That's what right. Here? They didn't have a job. Some of them didn't have no job. When it went in, it doesn't give it to somebody else. What about you? I had mine. They gave me mine back. Do you know why? Well, the strike was over. The home guards had left. I kind of like my daddy, a little bullheaded. And the strike had done been defeated. So I went on back in, you see. It done moved the home guard, so I went on back in. And it wasn't no, we were losing, uh, 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 fighting a losing battle to start with. And they're still fighting it today. You seen what happened not long ago, Phil Crest Camp. But that was the closest that they've ever come to having a union in Cabarrus County this last time. You think they'll do it next time? I believe they might do it the next time. And I'll tell you why they'll do it. If they get more colored people in there, they'll do it. Colored people will, will help to organize. I mean, they, they're, they're not afraid of it. Why, is it. why do you think the white people are afraid? Losing their jobs. Yeah, losing their jobs. Now, there'll be some over this last strike. They won't let them go right now over the strike. No, uh, the thing about it though, they'll find something to always, they can always find something, you know that. They can always find some, some, something there somewhere to let you go if it ain't nothing but cut the job out. <laughs> they always got something, they find something. See, when I was working in the mill, there's no such thing as seniority. No such thing as that. And uh, if you got a promotion or you got moved up, it's just because the overseer thought maybe you might could run the job. But most of the time back over at the old brown mill, it was family stuff. 
Maybe the father, my overseer, I mean, I was a good friend with him, but yet he had all his family in there working, see, and his kin people. But naturally, his kin people and family was going to get the best jobs. Now, Cannon Mill, they didn't allow as much as that as the Brown Mill did. Say that again. They just, Cannon just fired them, you see, the people that was in uh, working in the union, they find it out. They get shit out of you. They could. Nothing to be done about it. What about at the brown mill? It was different? Uh, same way. But the thing about the brown mill, they're more lenient with the people than the cannon mill was because it was owned by people in Charlotte. Yeah. This one was written by Lester Cook. Maybe one or two in a mill, you know, uh, or maybe in different parts of the mill trying to get some signed up. Our job would try to get some of them to sign a card, sign up, that they they go along with us. That was mostly our job, just trying to get them to sign up. Do you remember meeting people from Plant 6 when you all got together? No, back then I don't, it's been so long ago, I don't remember. Now these people at Plant 6, they filed charges against the mill. Yeah. What what was it about? Start that again, yeah? My first wife's uncle. Right after the strike? Yeah, he was uh, uh, laid off. So he had a daughter down at Plant 6. What was his name, McKinley? Ed Kinley, he did now. And... Uh, Anyway, he told me he said he wanted to go back to work, and uh, this was a good long while after the strike up, and I don't know where you'd want this or not on there. But anyway, he just w went up to Charlie Cannon's house and knocked on the door, and the butler came, came to the door. Now, this is what he had told me, and I know he told me the truth. And he told the butler he wanted to see Mr. Cannon. He said, wait just a moment. And after a while, he came back and said, come on and follow me. And he took him out to see Cannon's house downtown here. He took him out there, and Cannon was sitting in his uh, patio-like. And they sat there and talked. And my first wife's uncle now, he, he, he never went to school too much, but he would like a lawyer. And... He, he could talk just like a lawyer, I mean. He had educated his own self. And uh, he said, you know, I didn't have but one cigarette. And that old man asked me for it, and I gave him my last cigarette. But said, he told me, said, you going back down there? At the, said, you want to go back to work, Ed? And he said, yeah, I want to go to work. He said, well, you going back down there to the cannon mill, down at Plant Sick? There'll be a job for you down there. So Ed said, I, he asked me what shift I wanted to go on. I told him the second. He said, I went down there next day with my lunch, you know. Most people carried their lunch in either a candy box or a paper bag. And said, when I went, said the superintendent saw me and said, Ed, said, I got a job for you. He said, I know you got a job for me. Said, I'll come down here and go to work. He said, Well, I got a job for you. Put you back on your job. And so he went in and went back to work. And then later, at during the war, when the war came along, you know they'd froze wages. Well, the way they had done, he was a dolphin and they put on a different type of of uh your dolphin but a hank. They call it a hank, you know, a little clock. And they put on a different type of uh, yarn where it would take that yarn a lot longer to uh, wind where they'd lose it about $2 a day from what they'd been making that during the war, see, when the war started. So old Ed, he, he went and told them he, uh, that they wasn't allowed to cut his wages, and they'd cut his wages. Oh, they said they hadn't cut his wages. They said, no, you have. See, by putting on that different type of yarn and taking that longer to doff, see. And 
So he went and finally he just said he just quit. He quit. Him and one or two more just walked out and quit. Now, why do you think he, he wouldn't have got his job back if he didn't go visit Cannon Prison? No, he never got his job back. And uh, but he just won and didn't mind it, cause he come home and he wrote to the labor board about him cutting his salary, and they referred him to somebody else. His job put somebody else on his job, see, and so that's why the people were afraid to mess with the union too much. But still, a lot of people did, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah, and a lot of people lost their jobs. I don't know why. Seemed like the good Lord just took care of Mo and gave Mo them a better job. Afterwards? That's right. Seemed like they got better jobs. See, the Lord called me to preach. Is that a boy that was in there? The Lord called him to preach. My brother in law, Red Lith, he went to work with the union. And uh, every one of them seemed like got better jobs. Tell you the truth, I don't know. I worked in the mill for 22 years. And, did they uh, ever ask, did they ever warn you not to bring up the union ever again? No, no, but my overseer, like I told you, he told me, said they're talking about you out at the big office, Frank. See, the overseer and all would go out to the big office and have meetings out there. This is after the strike? No, that was before the strike when I was trying to sign people up in there. And uh, he told me, see, all the overseers in the mill would go out to the big office and have a meeting out there. And uh, he told me, said, Frank, you better watch out. Said, your name being brought up out there in, in the big office. Signed up, you know, old Les undoubtedly got them to sign up. They didn't get no, their job back. But now you see how many people right there was out of work. And some of them, no doubt, was all them at the Brown Mill. No, that's at Plant 6. That's all yeah. at Plant 6 at the Gibson Yeah, at a, at a Cannon Mill. See, there's more leaning over there at the Brown Mill than there were, like I said, than there were at the Cannon Mill. That's one reason I worked at the Brown Mill instead of working in the Cannon Mill. I went and worked, I don't know, six, seven, eight weeks at the Cannon Mill one time. And they lied to me, and I never did go. I, I just quit, went back over to Brown Mill, went to work. Like I said, my overseer is a good friend of mine. I went to his home one Sunday evening, didn't live far from where I live. And I told him I'd like to come back over there and go to work. I toured over, to, over there at the Plant 5. He said, well, you just come on back in next week. Was it after the strike or later on? Oh, this was after the strike. And yeah. now, did, did, did Red, you said Red was a real good speaker. Could you tell me anything else about him? Did he do a lot of traveling after that? Oh, yeah, he so done a lot of travel. He would, he, would, he would travel. He traveled a lot. I don't know how high or what he was in the Union whenever he retired. They, he had a heart attack and, and he had to retire. Well, as far as I know, Red was pretty well liked. Red come up from just the, uh, on the shotgun row over yonder to a uh, high standard of living. You know what I mean? So I think the union furnished his automobiles and everything for him. Now, were people frightened of him around here? I mean, no, not as I know of. Did he have a dangerous... I mean, how did people no, feel he, he, that you were related to this union organizer? <laughs> Well, it didn't bother him too much because Red was a pretty well-liked feller. He was, a, he was a nice feller, easy-going old boy. He wasn't a, really a troublemaker, but he knew how to get up and speak to people, you know. In fact, like I told you once before, I think the Lord had called Red to preach, and Red didn't take that calling. He went with the union. Oh yeah, Later we're. On, was it public? Did we, did we, did you hide it? No, I didn't try to hide it. See, I went up to 
the meeting at the Hotel Concord. I remember one we had. I went up, see. But I didn't try to hide it. But I didn't get out in the open and shout, hey, come on, let's join the union. I didn't do that. People I worked around, you know, they're in the mill. I'd try to get, the, get them, talk them into signing up, being part of it. And, uh, but getting them to come to a meeting now, that's a different tale. Yeah. Did you ever go house calling? Go talk to people in their homes? No, I don't believe I ever just went to their home to talk to them about the union. No, because all the ones that I was after them working in the mill. And we could go anywhere in the mill back then we wanted to. If I wanted to go up to the spinning room, card room, or anywhere else, I could go anywhere I wanted to in the mill. Inside the mill, I mean, during that, that during that organizing, was it? What was it like? Well, you mean what uh, the type of work or? No, I mean that the uh, you know where people you could go anywhere you wanted to to talk about to talk to anybody. You you had oh, to yeah. run the yeah. mill. So I'm wondering while people knew that you were organizing, or when there was that organize when the union was in the air. Way before the strike. Well, they didn't know what I'd go and talk to them about because I knew a lot of people back then, you see. And they didn't know what I was talking to one about. But that's why the, my overseer told me you better watch, watch it so they're talking about you out at the big office. Now, later on, when, after the strike and you went back to work and you were called to preaching, you know, even later than that, how did... Your, your union affiliation, did it ever, how did that, did you bring that with you into your later work? How did that affect you? No, I didn't. It, there in our mill, it was just dead. After the strike was over, I, that was it. What about for you personally? The what? What about for you? I mean, did, did, did people ever say, oh, there's the guy that was all for joining the union when you started preaching and you were out in the public? No, no. I, uh, like I say. I'm just wondering if the, if your background had an influence one way or another in your in the community, you know. No. Not as I know of. Uh, I was just another cotton mill hill fella. You know, after the strike was over with, everybody just calmed down, just like if nothing had ever happened. And that was it. And what did you do with your feelings about wanting to have a union? How did you feel when everything just went back to normal? Well, I just went back with the rest of them, you know, to normal too, like the rest of them. And I'm pretty sure if them people got any money, Back from the mill company, I'm pretty sure that my brother-in-law had something to do about that, getting that before the relation, labor relation board. Red lit. I'm pretty sure he the one that got that up there before. Oh, well, see, Red, had, uh, my brother-in-law, he'd clum high in the textile union. You know, he'd got up high. Cause like I told you, I, my nephew got pictures of him and the uh, president of the. Uh, textile Union and Johnson and all them, you know, the president. What did Red think about that strike? Did he believe in it? Did he think it was a good idea? Did he think it was a mistake? Do you remember? Well, I don't remember what he uh, thought about it. But see, Red helped organize a lot of these uh, other companies, you know, like uh, I think the cone mills. Some of them, all of them wasn't organized, but some of them was. And, uh, but he helped uh, organize a lot of meals, you see. But like I said, he went on up from an organizer to. Uh, but you can say that Red List was born in Concord. That's he right. He wasn't from the north, he was really from he, the He was really from around here. Yeah. And done the talking to Cannon for... Red's the one who I think coordinated that meeting. Yeah. 
Yeah, because he told me, Red told me that uh, he could go to a mill company back then and go in and demand. He went into one mill company and wanted to see their payroll book somewhere or another books, you know. And they told him, no, sir, he couldn't see. He said, I don't blame you. I'd be ashamed to let anybody see them too no more when you pay him. <laughs> but he could get, you know, uh, like a court order and go in and look at their book and see what they were paying people. You know. Was, did you did you feel at the time that there was a good chance that the union would would persevere and would win and would really get in? Did did you feel? Well, that? in a way I did, in a way I did, because it was a hard, people were so afraid of losing their job, and Rudabell had made it better for the working man, you know, to. Uh, uh, or the president had made it that labor laws had fixed it where a man could, you know, take his grievance before the labor board. But you didn't have a change hardly with them. Now let's see, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you about my wife's uncle a while ago. He went to Raleigh to the labor board about them cutting his way or uh, laid him off down here over on account of his salary, you know. And he said, they set him down and it's all around the table. And he said there wasn't but one in the group that knew anything about a textile mill and that was Dr. Dorton. And he was a big wheeler in Raleigh. And he had worked in the mill when he was a young fella. And Ed was one of them kind of men, you know, that he said they sat there at their head down a lot of them. So he told them, said, now you look and know anything about the textile. Dr. Dorton's the only one here that knows anything about it. And they never did do anything about it. But he went to, he went to Raleigh and met with the labor board up there himself over his job. But didn't do no good. See, this was after now he had went back, after the strike he'd went back, and then he had quit on kind of it, cutting his salary, you know, now, his pay. In all the years since then, did you talk to your family about your union activity? Did you talk about it in church? When the unions tried to come in, did you ever preach one way or another? Uh, I wasn't preaching then. And in 74? when they had that union election? 74. Yeah. What I'm asking is, over the years, have you talked about this experience with your children or was